OK. So to everyone here and anyone who's watching later, uh, welcome to MAP 610 Numerical Learning Algebra. As most of you know, I'm Dr. Lambers. So, um, OK, uh, handouts. I have, oh, right, OK. Um, um, and all that's in Canvas on uh, on my, my own site under the Maps Department server. Um, okay. Um, I believe everyone has the uh, textbook because it was used in some prior class. It's I guess one reason why I wrote a book so I could use it in pretty much every graduate class I teach. Um, so, it's been very convenient. Um, OK, so. Um, I'll just get through the nitty gritty real quick. Um, all right. Uh, the coursework, there are. Either four or five homework assignments. Um, it has been four historically, but it might come from the fifth one. We'll see. Um, and. Uh, uh, so those are a mix of. More theoretical problems worked out on paper or uh, MATLAB coding problems. Um, the fourth assignment is actually a there's two options. Um, so one is all coding, um, implementing an algorithm for computing eigenvalues in symmetric matrix, or the alternative is just a more a assignment of more regular problems uh, that are more theoretical in nature. So you can you can choose there. Um, I guess you think of the coding options kind of like a final project in a way. Um, not doing tests. Um, if you want to test in 610, you take a comprehensive exam for it. But most of your PhD students, so that'd be silly. <laughs> so, um, OK. Um, also, there will be um, online quizzes in Canvas um, that are uh, from what are called a uh, concept check uh, sections of the book. So. Uh, questions about like definitions of various things, properties of various algorithms, uh, uh, things can be found in the textbook. Which the textbook is one that you've been using, expressions in numerical analysis by myself and Amber Sumner. Um, and uh, so, the, the, all the except for the, the coding product itself, all the problems will be taken uh, from that. Um, okay, um, and all all the assignments involved will be graded equally and um, as your grade. Um, I, um, you'll see from the, assign from the assignments that there are due dates, but uh, well, almost all of you have taken a class from me before, and uh, so you would know that due dates for me are kind of advisory or super advisory. <laughs> so, uh, and there's only five people in the class, um, so I'm not, it's not, like, not like I, it's not like I'm going to have some avalanche of homework done to me at the end, um, but uh, at the same time, you don't want to you know, fall too far behind. Um, and uh, you know, if, if any of the problems are uh, too much of a bear, then go ahead and ask about that you know, in class or, or, or outside of class. Um, OK, um, so what is this course about? Um, it's solving fundamental problems from linear algebra, where it's a computer that's doing the work. Um, and while there's a connection between the algorithms we'll see and ones that you learn in an ordinary linear algebra class, the fact that it's a computer that's performing all the arithmetic involved um, does affect um, the, the algorithms to, to a certain extent. Um, and that's going to be a recurring theme. Um, we're going to focus on the first part of the class, systems and linear equations, you know, solving AX equals B, where A is a matrix and B is a known vector and X is your unknown vector. Um, now, for, for those of you who took math 561, uh, which I would have taught last spring, the first part of the class will be a rehash of that. Um, so, uh, sorry for any boredom that induces. Um, so, I think that applies to roughly half of you um, or 40%. Um, and then from there, we uh, um, diverged from what 561 covered. Um, least squares problems. Um, 
of, 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 of various kinds with or without uh, constraints. Um, so that's chapter four in the text. Uh, chapter five will be about iterative methods for solving A equals B, but different iterative methods from the ones that were covered in 561. So we're focusing on uh, Krilov subspace based methods and uh, methods of steep descent, conjugate gradient, um, and variants of, of that. Um, and then my favorite chapter, chapter six, about eigenvalue problems. So given a square matrix, how do you compute its eigenvalues? Um, and then a related problem, how do you compute uh, the singular values of a matrix? Uh, the algorithm for that was uh, the first um, general purpose algorithm that was actually developed by my advisor, uh, Tingala from, from Stanford. Um, so, uh, so, so I certainly have to teach about that. Um, at the end of the semester, um, I'll be tiptoeing into the field of statistical learning, machine learning, um, because there are a lot of connections between that field and numerical linear algebra. So a focus will be on how the techniques that we will have seen earlier in the course are used in, in, in that field. Um, if time permits, I might uh, dip a little bit into the world of uh, neural networks. So um, I haven't gotten that far in the past, so I don't know, but uh, we'll see. Because trying to make this class keep up with the times, I guess. <laughs> so, um, but it's interesting when I read about those kind of topics, I, all I really see are, oh, this is about the numerical analysis concepts that I already teach, but it's just presented or packaged differently. So, um, one could argue that neural networks is least squares of better marketing. So, um, okay, if somebody here says they're going to, if they're in that field, they're probably going to hate me, but um, I don't care. They can prove me wrong at any time. I invite it. Um, okay, so, um, so, so that's the, the, the quick summary of uh, what we'll be seeing. And uh, what I'll be doing for today. Uh, so you have a lecture schedule, you can send, unless there's some sort of disaster like a, a hurricane or tornado or something uh, that causes class to be canceled, I will be sticking to that schedule um, exactly. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. And seems most semesters there's something that goes wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, Alex, I mean, one student class is online. Um, because uh, it's, it's the only uh, um, option. Um, so, as in my other classes, um, we have this, this is, uh, we have a Teams meeting going. I'm recording at. Uh, that's why my laptop is here. Uh, so, um, and, yes, so you have a choice. You can either you know, show up in person, or you can uh, watch it live uh, from elsewhere, or you can watch a recording later. Um, now, um, in a previous class, I think it was. Uh, Last semester in 721, I was using Cisco WebEx and that presented a problem if someone was attending that it would like Teams lets you spotlight yourself. Uh, so that's a dominant part of the video. Um, and Cisco WebEx doesn't let you do that. I'm using Teams now. So yeah, if you want to attend you know, because a, a synchronous online class, uh, I think that would, unlike last semester, that would work well. So you could do that if you want. Okay. Okay. Um, Alrighty. Now, I feel like I have too many pages and notes to possibly cover all at once, but um, I don't know. Maybe it's have to pick some things to skip, but we'll, or or gloss over. We'll see. Um, I hope I have some thought. You know, last time I taught this class, this class runs every two years in the spring, and the last time it was in the midst of COVID, and it was all done online. And so it feels kind of weird to uh, be uh, uh, back in that mode. Okay, so. So it shows up well. It's kind of weirding me out that watch looking at my screen now, everything I write shows up backwards. But I have to remember that in the recording, it'll turn out it'll be flipped back. <laughs> so, um, okay. And because if anyone watches the video, they can let me know if uh, what I write in the board uh, comes through. <laughs> um, because it can be some glare. All right. So, um, the problem that we're going to look at throughout 
chapter three. Um, solve AX equals B for X. Um, matrix A is N by N and assumed to be invertible. Um, B and X um, are N by one uh, vectors. So in the numerical linear algebra world, vectors are assumed to be uh, column vectors. So basically just a matrix of one column. If there's a situation where we really want uh, it to be a row vector for whatever reason, and, and that does happen, then we have to take the transpose. Okay, so um, when you're designing an algorithm for solving a problem like this, um, a good framework for figuring out how to do that is to pose a couple of uh, rather generic questions. Um, and this turns out to work well for a variety of problems uh, beyond uh, linear algebra. Uh, so the first question is, Under what conditions is this problem particularly easy to solve? Um, uh, so, so, you know, maybe certain uh, class categories that the matrix A can fall into that that, that make it easy. Um, and then once that is addressed, um, then we return to a general problem where A is any n by n verbal matrix. But how can we reduce or, tr or transform the general problem? To one of these easy cases. Um, so, now I'll talk about a few easy cases. Um, the easiest case of all, A is diagonal. Um, so, in other words, all the entries A, I, J are zero um, if I is not equal to J. So only when the row and column indices are equal do you have non-zero entries. Um, we're assuming that A is invertible, so all of those diagonal entries would have to be non-zero. Um, so we'll fill that assumption. Um, so in that case, it's really easy to figure out what to do. Each element of the solution X sub I is just equal to corresponding elements of the right hand side B I divided by A I I. Um, so, how we'll describe how efficient this algorithm is or how much what the computational expense is, we're only performing N divisions. So, no way putting it is this algorithm requires n flops. Flop stands for floating point operation. It's kind of a strange, silly acronym, but that's what I'll be using. Um, so we really like algorithms like this that are have a form of number of operations that's linear in terms of the size of the problem. We're dealing with the n by n matrix, uh, give it an n by n of one n vector b, so being able to solve a problem with just n operations is great, but normally we don't have that luxury. Most things we, we see will be more expensive than that. Okay. Um, and also it can be quite difficult to transform a general 
and by a matrix into diagonal form. It, it can be done. You actually learn how to do it in your first linear algebra course. Um, but we're actually going to stop short of that. Um, and consider a matrix A that is upper triangular. Now we'll be dealing with upper or lower triangular matrices a lot in this course. Um, and I don't like to write out upper triangular or lower triangular, so I have my shorthand for it. I'll introduce it now. So this symbol, the, the triangle. Wait, that's wrong. Wow, I'm really off today. Sorry. Upper triangular, and then the triangle I drew earlier would be for lower triangle. Um, I even have one for diagonal. That. Um, so those will, will come in handy. Um, all right. So, um, the easiest way to convey how easy it is to solve these systems is through an example. Okay. Um, so, if I have a system of uh, three equations, um, three unknowns. So, I have uh, x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 is equal to 5 minus 4x2 plus x3 is equal to 2 and then minus 2x3 is equal to 4. So in other words, A is a matrix. If I read all the coefficients of the x's, 1, 2, 1, uh, 0, minus 4, 1 and then minus 2 for x3. So since there's no x1 and x2 terms down here, those entries will be 0. So um, the matrix is upper triangular. A at j is equal to 0 when i is strictly greater than j. Um, so, how do we solve this system? What's the first thing we can do? Well, X3. <laughs> yeah, use the last equation, which tends to. The key is in the dial case, each equation had only one unknown, unknown in it. Here, this equation has only one unknown in it. So, again, we can form a division like in a diagonal case. So, X3, we just before division. And uh, so now we have X3. And then what is the next thing we can do? Substitute. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned naming the algorithm, back substitution. So we could take X3 and substitute it in there to get X2. Um, so X2 is equal to 2 minus X3 divided by minus four, um, and that node value is plugged in here. Um, and we would get uh, minus one. Um, and then we can take this value and X3 and substitute it into the top equation. Now we have X1 is equal to um, five minus uh, X3 minus 2X2 um, all over 1. Um, and then we end up with 9 for that. Okay. Um, wait. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so at least in that case, we have a clear path forward. Uh, we just jump to the last equation, um, solve that, and then go all, go all the way up. All right now, um, but clearly this is going to require more expense uh, than 
um, thought we'd buy the system did. Um, and to see how expensive it will be, we can uh, look at the um, uh, Okay. Let me try looking at the uh, more general case. Any questions up to this point before I start erasing stuff? So, the for general upper triangular matrix, use what's called process that I showed you in this example, back substitution. Um, so, in a more general case, we have like A11, X1 plus A12, X2. All the way down to a one and x n and equal to b n. B, sorry, not b yet. B one for the first equation, and then we keep going. So the second equation does not depend on x one at all because of the uh, upper triangular matrix. Any coefficients below the main diagonal must be zero. B two. Then we keep going, and as we get down to the end, n minus two, n minus two, x, n minus two, plus I should give myself more room, minus two plus a, n minus two, n minus one, plus one plus a, n minus two, n, x, n, I'm just going to write out the last three equations of the system. Um, so we have a, a minus one, and minus one. So I have all the x's lined up as much as possible. A, a n minus one, n x n equals b n minus one. So this equation has only two terms, three terms. Last equation is only a single term. Okay. Um, so, so by solving these, starting from the bottom, um, what we get is, okay, but in general, Xn is Bn over Ann, and then we substitute that value up here. So then we have next unknown is Bn minus 1. Subtract this term off as a n minus one n x n divided by the diagonal entry here. And then this continues. So we substitute both known values into the equation about it. So we always start with a right hand side value. And then we subtract off terms containing unknowns whose values we know. We always have some entry of your matrix where notice the uh, row entry is always strictly less than the column entry. That's the non-zero part of an upper triangular matrix. Um, and to track out how many terms you need. And then once you finish the tracking terms off, you're always dividing by the diagonal entry. So a n minus two n minus two. So all those must be non-zero. Um, and that will continue until all the unknowns are found. Um, you see that um, as we go up through the equations, we're always subtracting up more and more terms. First none, then one, then two, and so on. Uh, until we get to well, First equation in the whole system, and we're subtracting off n minus one terms before the division. Um, 
So seeing these patterns and how we compute these unknowns, we can write out a general algorithm, something that can be coded in a language such as MATLAB. Um, so uh, I'll show you what that algorithm is. Um, all right, and uh, the notation I use will be a little different just because of consistency of what I'll do later. Or u x is equal to y. So x is still the unknown. The right hand side is referred to as y. The upper triangular matrix is called u. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so what do we do? Well, for one thing, we're going to figure out the unknowns starting from the last and uh, going back to the first. So that means we're going to have a loop. Um, so what most programming languages have a for loop. I use I to refer to my row index as is customary. Um, so I'm going to work for the bottom row. All the way to the top. The idea is inside this loop, so I'll just put an end down here. I probably don't need that much space, but whatever. Um, the job with it in each iteration of the loop is to compute the i-th unknown. <clears throat> so our starting point is whatever unknown we're computing, the starting point is always the corresponding right hand side value. So we start with x i is equal to y i because the right hand side is referred to as y now. Um, then we will subtract off however many terms we need to, which might be none. Um, so that's going to call for a number loop because we're subtracting off uh, a growing number of terms. So there's an inner iteration is required. As is customary, I'll use J to refer to a column index because look at the entries of a matrix that we're using here. Whatever unknown we want, like N minus one in this case, N minus one is the row index. The column index starts out at one greater than that and keeps increasing. Watch the column indices, N minus one, N. Um, it's not the best example, but. Um, but you get the idea. So J will start at this index, row index I plus one, and keep going all the way to N. And what we'll do is we'll subtract off one term. So what is that term? It's going to be U I J, because row column indices have now been figured out times and notice which unknown do we have here it always matches a column index column index n minus one x n minus one column index n x n so it's x j so again they match um and then that's all we do there the last thing to do is divide by the corresponding diagonal entry of your matrix so Xi is divided by Ui I. And that's the process. Um, the first time around when I is equal to N, J will run from N plus one to N. But when the starting value is greater than the ending value, it means loop won't run at all. You, this loop won't execute in that case. There's nothing to subtract off, which is consistent with what we have here. But okay, first first when you're a first unknown x n. All right, so i is equal to n. So j will loop from n plus one to n. Yeah. But since, yeah. Um, so we don't have to control for that. Right. Yeah, there's no need to check. It's automatically going to. Yes. 
skipped. Uh, yes. Um, yes. So, but and there may be some might just might behave differently. But generally speaking, you're supposed to count from point A to point B, and you're supposed to be counting up. Um, and point A is greater than point B. We're going to go now. Um, whereas here, we're intentionally counting backwards. So in MATLAB, for instance, there'd be a different syntax for that. Um, so that's how it runs. Um, and then the next time around, I will be N minus one. So J will go from N to N, one iteration, subtract off one term, and then it goes from there. So now you have an algorithm that's written in a pseudocode here, but then can be readily translated into a variety of programming languages, such as in MATLAB or Python or what have you. Um, any questions about how this algorithm? If we use like a summation chart instead of or would that work too? Um, well, you can certainly write it that way. Um, but yes, so actually what this loop accomplishes is xi is equal to itself minus the sum. Yeah, but then how do you implement it? Uh, now, certain programming languages may have a nice syntactic facility to carry out summations. Like I know Python has things like that, but that's a language dependent thing. Oh, uh, I know we did for a symbolic package, but for outside of that too? Okay. Oh, yeah, I never touched that. I, I, well, I want to do symbolic things that you like use Maple because then actually a symbolic toolbox is an interface to Maple. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's an instance of MATLAB not staying in its lane. Um, uh, okay. Oh, no, no. All right. Now, um, are there any questions about how this algorithm came to be? until 215. Okay, I'm actually doing pretty well as far as making sure I get through my notes. Um, no, under normal circumstances, it seems like you get through like four pages of notes or so during a for a graduate class, but I have eight pages. <laughs> um, okay. Um, now, for a diagonal matrix, we could easily see that the only work done is n divisions. How many operations is this going to take up? Well, that's going to take a bit more work to. to Figure out. Um, and unfortunately, this is actually actually is not my notes, so I'm gonna knock myself behind, but whatever. Um, but we can use this algorithm to figure out how many operations there will be. So, um, so on each individual step that actually carries out an arithmetic operation, I'll just make a note of how many there are. So here we have one operation here, just a division. Uh, here we have a subtraction and a multiplication. So this step carries out to uh, an assignment will not count. There's no arithmetic going on there, so we're not going to bother with that. Um, but then we take into account how many times does each loop run? Well, this inner loop runs n minus j times because it starts at no, no not j, n minus i times. Um, because it starts at i plus one. So the total number of um, iterations. So that means that this loop requires two times n minus i operations. Um, so now the entire body of the loop carries out this plus this number of arithmetic operations. Um, so that means that the total number of flops is equal to the sum from, and uh, we're considering all values of i between one and n. Yes, we're going backwards, but for figuring out how many, it's fine to count forwards. So it'd be two times n minus i plus one. Um, so now we could 
um, they can figure out what that is using certain formulas for certain summations. Um, now, adding up one n times just going to give us n. So um, I'm going to have 2n sum of 1 minus 2 sum of i plus sum of 1, where I'm being lazy here, not running out i equals 1 to n. Um, OK. Well, this summation of one will just give us n. Um, so we get 2n squared. And then the sum of i going from 1 to n is formula by Gauss's child, n times n plus 1 over 2. Um, um, and then adding up 1n times gives us n. Um, OK. So. Um, once we simplify all of this, it turns out to be exactly n squared. Um, so it takes an order of magnitude more work to carry out back substitution to solve a system with an upper triangular matrix than it does uh, solve a diagonal system, which makes sense because there's so, so many more non-zero entries uh, to contend with. Um, and we're going to see a lot of algorithms in this semester where um, the complexity is order n cubed, so not doing not too badly here. Questions about how the number of operations was figured out. Okay. Um, now, um, I've talked about uh, diagonal and upper triangular. The other easy case, but it's actually not so interesting after what I've done, is the case of a lower triangular matrix. I'm not really going to spend time on that. Um, we will later. Um, so the third category of easy matrix is lower triangular. It's shorthand. Um, so that case, AIJ equals zero if low index is strictly less than the column index. So the idea there is the first equation is one that's easy to solve. So we can use the opposite of back substitution. It's called forward substitution. That also takes order n squared of operations. It's the same work to done in the opposite order, uh, where you take a right-hand side value, you subtract off terms corresponding to unknowns you already have, you divide by a diagonal entry. Um, it's, it really is the same. Um, OK, um, but as far as describing an algorithmic way for solving a system of equations, general system of equations, um, right now we don't need to deal with forward substitution, but it'll come in handy uh, next time. <clears throat> um, um, what I'd rather focus on is now that we have ways of solving easy systems of equations, what can we do with general system equations to reduce it to an easy case like to upper triangular form? Um, OK. So So we have a still n by n invertible matrix. That's that's what we're sticking with all chapter long uh, to reduce general A to well, upper triangular form. Because once we have upper triangular form, we know exactly what to do. Um, 
could use what you know of from your first learning algebra course. Row operations or elementary row operations. Okay, and there are three row operations um, to consider. Um, which I'm writing in the same order as in the text. Uh, so scaling a row. Basically, you're just scaling one of the equations in your system. Um, but what we're doing here, we're actually not going to need that one. Um, but it is used in like a person around the course. Um, and then we have swapping rows. Um, that is necessary from time to time. We will be needing that, uh, but it's important. So I'll come around to it later. But the, but the fundamental one, um, by far, uh, is uh, the most essential one by far is the um, tracking. A multiple of row J from row I. Um, so that's what we will use to eliminate certain unknowns from certain equations to make progress toward um, upper triangular form. Um, now, okay. So as an example, we have a uh, three by three system. I can start this example so that every step of the way the numbers will work out nicely. I found it's not as easy to do as you might think. Um, okay, so in other words, our matrix A is equal to 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 4, 4, 4, 3. And the vector B, the right hand side, is equal to 5, 17, 1, 6. So we're working just sort of with these entities. So, what row operations we perform? Um, so, I use a shorthand here for this. We have uh, first, we, we're going to work on the first column. We want every entry. So, these entries, this one, this one, this one, are targeted for elimination. So, we'll start from the first column below the diagonal and work our way to the bottom, um, and then move to the second column. Start below the diagonal, work away to the bottom. In this case, there's just one entry. Um, so how this unfolds is first row operation is a uh, so row two is replaced by itself minus three times r one because this entry is three. We want to um, eliminate it. What we get is um, for the matrix, 
we'll have a first row won't change. We'll have a zero here, and then we have to update the rest of the second row from multiplying uh, these elements by three and subtracting. And what we'll get is uh, five plus four, one. Uh, um, and then we do the same thing to B. We subtract three times its first element from the second element. So that's going to give us uh, 5 to 26. And then we haven't done anything. Well, actually, that'll be the next step. Row 3 is replaced by itself minus 4 times the first row because we have this 4 to get rid of. Um, so it's going to give us zero, and then uh, uh, okay, minus four again, and then minus one, and then the third entry, the right hand side, will be six. So now we've worked, uh, dealt with the first column. All diagonals, uh, all entries below the diagonal in the first column, have been eliminated. Um, then we move to the second column. We need to uh, subtract this row from this, this one. Um, so then row three is equal to itself. Um, and since the entries, these two are equal, we're just going to subtract row two. Um, so now, We end up with minus two. And then we do the same thing. We subtract the second entry from the third over here. Okay. Actually, that's actually the triangle system that I showed you earlier. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, this is known in the in our introductory linear algebra class as row echelon form. Uh, um, in the American Apple community, we don't really use that lingo. We decided they say it's our triangular. Um, and in a interlinear algebra class, normally you would go further to get to reduced row echelon form, where um, you also eliminate entries that are above a diagonal, and you also scale the rows to make these entries one. Uh, we're not going to do that either. There's no need. Um, we have the triangular system. We can see use back substitution and it's solved. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, and then certainly there's a process familiar to you from such a linear algebra class um, that may have been long ago. <laughs> um, but what we want to do is be able to come up with an algorithm that carries out this process that could be implemented in some programming language. Um, so, if each of the row operations we're performing, we have to lay out systematically which rows we subtract from which other row. What, what are we multiplying at row by before we subtract it? Um, and what is the uh, formula for that? Um, so, so, so that has to be uh, worked out. Um, so, now you, so now I'll show you um, how that is done. So our goal is to eliminate the entry AIJ, where I is greater than J, by the following row operation. Row I is replaced by itself minus some scaling factor, and I'm going to refer to that as M I J times row J. And this number M I J is called a multiplier. So we need to know what is the correct value of a multiplier. 
to eliminate AIJ. Well, if you look at what we want to achieve, the new AIJ is equal to the old AIJ minus the multiplier times the element from row J that's in the same column as the entry we want to eliminate. So the entry that's above it, directly above it. So that would be a JJ. And once we perform this row operation, we want the new AIJ to be zero. So what's MIJ? That will carry that out. We can solve for it. Yeah, so the entry you're trying to eliminate divided by the diagonal entry in that same column. Uh, so that's how we get the multipliers. <clears throat> OK. Um, and once we use that multiplier on A, we use the same multiplier on B, because of course, we have to perform the same row operation on both sides of the equation, system of equations. Um, OK. So now, uh, Now I can, I can lay out for you um, the algorithm for cost elimination. Similar to how it was done for back substitution. Okay. Uh, um, so the album for that's elimination is we're going to have a first group. We keep in mind that we're going to start by eliminating entries in the first column, they go to the second column, third column, all the way to the end. Now, in the last column, the last entry in that column is a diagonal entry. Energy else is above a diagonal. So in the last column, we don't need to do anything. So our outermost loop, we use J as customary column index, and we'll go as far as column N minus one, because that's the last column in which we actually need to eliminate something. Um, within the J column, we're going to start at the entry right below the diagonal. So we'll, our, our, the, the first row we'll work on and, and keep going down, down, down the column all the way to the bottom. So there's going to be an inner loop. We use I as a customary row index, and we'll start from row J plus one, so right below the diagonal, and keep going all the way down to the bottom. So now inside this inner loop, the job is to perform one row operation to eliminate AIJ. So the purpose of this loop is all the work done on column J. Everything goes inside here. Thanks. AIJ for the appropriate row operation. So what do we need to know to perform a row operation? We need to know what row we're targeting, what row we're subtracting from it, and what the multiple is. Um, well, we know what row we're going after. We know what row we're using to get it. Uh, that's you know, I and J. Um, and now we'll put in the formula for multiplier. That's AIJ over a JJ. So now 
we need to perform the row operation itself um, and actually update row I accordingly. Now, um, at first I'm going to be lazy about this, and then it's going to perform your operation on the entire row, which is wasteful, but I'll explain why and then we'll fix it. So I'll use K as a column index because I'm already using J. Uh, cause chaos to reuse an index in the middle of a loop. So if we loop over all the columns, then we perform a row operation. So A, A I, K is equal to itself minus M, I, J, A, J, K. Um, so that will subtract the multiplier times row J from row I. Notice all the column indices of entries of A are the same because the rows line up. Um, all right, and that takes care of that. The only thing left to do is we also have to update the right hand side B. Same row operation over there. B I is equal to itself minus the multiplier times row J of B, which is just B sub J. Um, okay, so so this algorithm will get the job done. Uh, that A will be reduced to upper triangular form, assuming we never encounter a zero here. Now that can happen. That leads to what's called pivoting and row interchanges. We'll get, get to that in a later section. Um, so for now, we'll assume it's not an issue. Um, all right. Um, so first, any questions about how this algorithm came to be? How it carries out the process described in examples? Okay. Now. I need to address the wastefulness in this algorithm. Um, for one thing, uh, there's no point in working on entries that are to the left of column J because we're already working on entries that are below the diagonal or AIJ is below the diagonal. So any entries in that in row I that are to the left of column J. Um, Keeping in mind that I is greater than J. So if we're looking at an entry that's in the same row I, but in a column to the left, that column index is even smaller. When the matrix is um, being reduced over triangular form, any entry where the row index is greater than a column index is going to be zero. Entries to the left of this are already zero. So we don't need to operate on that. So right, that right there allows us to start at column J um, and save ourselves from some effort. Um, does that make sense to everybody? And you can see from working an example that that's how it plays out. Um, okay, um, so we have A I J or A I K sorry equal, equals zero for K strictly less than J. Now, there's one more optimization I can make, and you might think of it as a little controversial, or it's something that students have difficulty um, either understanding or accepting. It throws them off a bit. Uh, so I'll just give that disclaimer up front. Um, we don't need to work on column J either. Now, that entry, AIJ, is the entry we're trying to eliminate. Um, but the multiplier is chosen specifically so AIJ will turn out to be zero. If we know what the result is, we don't need to actually carry it out. Because keep in mind, AIJ is an entry that's in the lower triangle. Once this is done, and then we take the upper triangular matrix and then use it to solve the system, back substitution will only reference the upper triangular part. It doesn't look at the lower triangular part. So if we're leaving random stuff there, it's of no consequence. And it's all about saving floating point operations. Don't carry out, don't make the computer carry out an operation 
but for results, it's already known. Um, so a practical implementation, we'll actually start at column J plus one. Those are the entries that actually matter for making sure that back substitution is carried out, is working on the correct matrix. Because um, when, when a student implements this algorithm as written, I mean, they try it on a matrix, they're expecting a, an upper triangular matrix to pop out of it, and it doesn't. Um, and like, hey, something's wrong here. Should we start in column J? It's like, no. Um, the upper triangle of a matrix is correct. It's just that you have this other stuff you're going to ignore. Um, and uh, in a later version of this algorithm, we're actually going to make use of the lower triangle. Um, so we still have a loop this way, but um, but when I talk about the LU decomposition, uh, I'll, I'll explain all of that. So, so, um, yeah, so, so, so only perform the operations that are actually needed for whatever it is you're doing. Um, it doesn't get the result that looks like what I want, like, oh, I, I want a pretty upper triangular matrix. So, no, um, but practice is a shortage. For the sub diagonal entries, then, when we finish this, this algorithm, yeah. The diagonal and, and super diagonal is you. Yes, it is. Yes. So yeah. those entries are occupied by what should be there. But the sub diagonal entries are not not going to be else at this point. Um, oh, from the LED composition? They're no. trash. They're trash. So then, OK, so it's not like we can use what's sitting there. Um, no. Um, so when we get to the LED composition, we take the multipliers we compute and we stop them in the lower triangle and overwrite the trash. OK, so. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, just use the storage efficiently. Now, the thing is, the way this algorithm is written, how it works on both A and B, we don't need to keep the multipliers past this point. Uh, now, I, I've yet to establish the benefit of having an LED composition, that's something I'll talk about next time. Um, because it, once we get to that part, we'll only be working on A. Um, the, um, I guess what we could do, once we've done this, we could just carry out back substitution with the U immediately. Um, if we only work on A, we still have to work on B, and that's where the L comes in. I get a little ahead of myself, but yeah, uh, that'll, that'll all be flushed out um, uh, 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 next class. Um, okay. Our questions? Yeah. It's that is starting J equals one to N minus one. Why not just start at two? Uh, ignore first column. The first two. Books. Um, oh, but your matrix wouldn't be able to try ignore. No, but it's still going to start computing for because it's starting at the second element. Oh, oh wait, you still need to update all the other rows with. Yeah, J refers to a column. Exactly, that's what I was saying. Because we're starting at second column anyway. No, we're not. Oh, we're starting. We're starting in the second element of the first column. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, now, um, now it's possible to do the same thing uh, with um, efficiency analysis, runtime analysis that was done for back substitution. It'd be more onerous exercise, but now we have three layers of loops rather than, than two. Um, so we start flop counting. Uh, here we have two flops. Uh, here we also have two flops, but this loop runs um, n minus j times. Um, and then we have one flop there. So then the second loop over over i, uh, this whole thing requires two n minus j plus three. Um, the K would wouldn't be two times and minus J minus one. Um, 
Oh, um, okay. So you subtract this from this, and then you add one. Yeah. Uh, or number you think about the first J you're left out. Um, okay. Um, oh, wait a minute. I drew my brace wrong. One iteration of that loop takes two times the minus J plus three flops. Um, but then we have to sum that for uh, I going from uh, J plus one to N. Um, so flops could be pretty ugly. So sum J equals one to N times sum I equals J plus one to N of two times N minus J plus three. Uh, so, yikes. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I, I won't go for all the details here, but what it turns out to be, once you work all this out, keep in mind, so we're already having a linear number of flops in N at first, but then we go through two layers of summations on top of that. So the order of magnitude is going to be N cubed. In fact, the, the leading term is two thirds N cubed. Um, so that is the running time complexity of Gaussian elimination. Um, so, but that, that, that's typical. All the algorithms that we'll see all semester working with a dense n by n matrix, meaning a matrix where most of the entries are, are non zero, if not all of them, uh, uh, I would generally take order n cubed operations. Um, so that's just the way it goes. Um, I don't think we'll see anything worse than that, <laughs> thankfully, but. Um, and in some nice cases, you can you can do a little better. Um, we will see some methods where the constant in front of the n cubed can be reduced. Like if a matrix is symmetric, it's possible to reduce the system to a nice form in one third n cubed operations by exploiting the symmetry. Okay. Um, all right. Actually, I have time to be in my notes. <laughs> so. That worked out pretty well. Well, the house skips some things, but um, and if, for the second example of gas elimination, um, the, the thing is, in the introductory numerical linear algebra class, and uh, not numerical, intro linear algebra class, like here we have math 326. Um, way since it's been solved is you have your A and your B, you put them together in what's called an augmented matrix. So then you perform row operations on the entire thing. That's effectively what this is doing. It's working on both um, A and B. Um, and then um, once you get to that point where it's, where it's said to be an echelon form, um, then you're tasked with performing additional row operations to eliminate entries that are above a diagonal. But that is mathematically equivalent to what I'm just showing you in back substitution. So back, they don't refer to it as back substitution in a class like that. Uh, but that's what they're doing. Um, but um, as I'll explain next time, it's, it's more practical to consider working on A and B separately because what if you have to solve A X equals B numerous times with the same A but different Bs? And that sounds fanciful, but it's actually a thing um, where but that's that situation can come up. Um, so you don't want to form augmented matrices all the time where most of the augmented matrix is the same. That's that's, that's wasteful. Uh, but if you keep track of what you're doing on A to use it on B later, uh, that 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 works well. Um, getting, getting ahead of myself, but um, OK. So. Um, I right, that's something I'll get into. Um, on uh, Tuesday. You can from keep wanting to say Monday. I guess by my, I'm in this room at from one o'clock to two fifteen, Monday through Thursday. So I have you guys Tuesday, Thursday, and then I'm my other class Cal three Monday, Wednesday. So um, I'm gonna get my days mixed up. Um, okay, so um, uh, so at any time you can go look at the the um, quiz for um, let's see, actually see what I have as far as quizzes are concerned. In Canvas, I might have it organized a little differently than in, in like 560 or 561. 
Um, and then as usual, I'll have the recording of this class and the notes I've just been looking through posted in Canvas in the discussion item. Um, OK, assignments. OK, so the first quiz is on the um, the whole of chapter three, <laughs> so there's not a whole lot you can do yet um, unless you want to jump ahead. Um, uh, it's already up. Actually, every, every uh, um, oh, uh, oh, wow, it's not. Oh, my God, that's terrible. Um, OK, let's just publish publish that um, and also the first homework. Uh, these are not due until like a while. Um, but whoops, <laughs> thank you for pointing it out. Dang. Um, Quiz blind. Leave me on the tiger bars. Yes, OK. And then um, I'll start putting links on the main page to these things just for convenience. Um, OK, wow, yikes. Um, <laughs> um, OK, um, I guess that's it. Um, unless you have any questions or anything. Okay. Okay.